What's up, future respiratory therapist? Hey, guys. Man, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm about to get real, real with you guys because you deserve to know what you're going into. That's the bottom line. That's the bottom line. You deserve what you... You deserve to know what you're getting into as a respiratory therapist. Now, you can see on the board back here, I have an example of a scenario that I'm going to talk about. Okay, so I'm going to get to that in a little bit. But just here for a few minutes, I want to just share with you. I just want to be so real with you because I'm so annoyed right now. Seriously, I I, I just spent a, a, a little bit of time this morning off and on in a Twitter conversation with a person and the conversation was over quality respiratory care it was me i put a post if you haven't seen it and you're on twitter go check me out um it's coach rrt and i i put a post up and all i said was if you're looking for um a new year's resolution as a respiratory therapist consider performing and making it a, an intentional effort to perform one-on-one therapy and deciding to provide quality care over this idea of quantity of care, which means I'm going to focus on one patient at a time and I'm going to provide them with the most quality care I can and I'm not going to focus on getting all of these 60, 70, 80 treatments done in a shift. That's not my focus anymore. I want to be a better respiratory therapist. I want to be a respiratory therapist that creates impact at my patient's bedside. And that's all it said. It just said, hey, just consider this. And what, what transpired from there was quite interesting because I basically uh, was involved with a back and forth, very good discourse between another person who was advocating for quantity respiratory therapy. They, were, they, they, they basically were saying that, saying that I can give quality respiratory care while stacking therapy. Which to me is absurd. Of course you can give, like, of course you can, you can, on a certain level, there's like levels of crappiness, right? Like, I'm going to really try to watch my language here. I talked to my mom this morning. She said, whenever you're doing a video or a presentation or talking at a conference, keep it professional and no curse words. So I'm going to try to do that, okay? So of course you can give crappy therapy Stacking therapy, one-on-one. Just go in, put the treatment on, leave, go do another one. Go in, do it, put the treatment on, leave, go do another one. And then go back and take them all off or even not go take them all off. Now, there's a certain level of that where you can still provide what in your mind you tell yourself is, I'm still going to stack therapy, but I'm going to do it in a quality fashion, which means you go in, you introduce yourself to your patient, you assess them, you start the therapy, and then you leave. And you leave and you go, okay, that was quality. I did a good I did a good job. It's not it's not a scale of of quality like okay well I'm I'm happy because I gave this much quality. Look, the end of the day the end goal is this. You as a respiratory therapist go into your patient's room and you take care of that patient for the time that you are going to charge that patient for. You can't how, how it's it's honestly, it's an ethical issue. If you're considering that you're going to charge three, four, five patients for the same 20 minutes of time. That's like having a plumber come to your house. They, they come to your house, they fix your plumbing problems. While they're fixing their pro, pro, plumbing problems, they go to your neighbor's house and fix their plumbing problems. They spend a total of two hours at both houses. And they charge you for two hours when you know they spent an hour over at the other house. Are you going to pay that plumber two hours worth of work? No. Why not? Because he was only with you for one hour. That's the same thing. It's the same concept, guys. Just because we charge in healthcare for therapy that we do. And it's like this unknown number and the patient's just going to get billed for it or Medicare is just going to take it and pay it. And nobody asks, nobody holds you accountable for were you really in a room for, for 15 minutes? You hold yourself accountable to that 15 minutes knowing that when you charged and you gave that patient a treatment at 7 o'clock, you were in there from 7 to 7.15 and you were taking care of that patient, monitoring them, pre-assessment. 
instructing them properly on how to do the therapy that they're doing. A, a full post assessment, educating them on their disease process and on what they should be doing and meeting any and all of their needs in that 15 minutes. That's what respiratory therapy is about. It's not about a race to get done with first rounds because you can do 30 treatments in 45 minutes. That's, that's, that's hogwash. That's crap. And it, it irritates. I don't even know why somebody would argue in favor of stacking therapy. Like, I can understand somebody saying, I get what you're saying, but the reality of healthcare world today makes it really hard to do that. I wish I lived in a world where I could perform one-on-one -on -one therapy, which you can. It's just extremely difficult. This is my New Year's resolution. From a professional standpoint, my goal is to highlight and to bring to the surface for all of you future respiratory therapists this conundrum that you're about to go into and understanding that treatment stacking is not okay. It's, it's, it's ethically wrong to take care of more than one patient at one time and charge for the same time. It doesn't promote quality respiratory therapy. Respiratory therapy. It, it, it's just substandard. That's what it is. Okay. Now, at the end of the day, and you want to know why I'm annoyed, it's because at the end of the day, the person I'm having this discourse with isn't even a practicing respiratory therapist anymore. This person has a license still, but they're not even practicing as a respiratory therapist, which tells me that they either got fired because they were a crappy respiratory therapist or they quit to go pursue something they thought was going to be better because they didn't find satisfaction in respiratory therapy. You know why? Because all they're doing is stuffing treatments on patients and going to the next. You want to be satisfied as a respiratory therapist? Take care of your patients one-on-one. -on -one. Take care of them. Meet their needs. Make their hospital stay better. Improve it. And if it's a treatment that is not indicated, then get it DC'd. That's, that's what I'm trying to say. Well, how do we do all these therapies? Most of them aren't even needed. You as future respiratory therapists, you're in student mode right now, you know, you see in your clinical experience and working with other respiratory therapists, you see how many therapies actually make a difference in that patient. How many albuterol SVNs actually make a difference? Very few of them. There's very few status asthmatics that's sitting on the floor right now counting down the minutes to that treatment. There's I just can't get I just can't get it I just can't fathom the idea of actually arguing for concurrent therapy or treatment stacking because that's what the current system allows for. Look, the current system is flawed. We all know that. Why is it that Respiratory therapy is uniquely the only health science discipline that accepts performing therapy on more than one person at a time as okay. Why is that? There's no answer. It's because we created it. Look at physical therapy. You ever seen a physical therapist walking two patients at a time? Nope. You know why? Because it's unsafe. You ever seen an occupational therapist working with two patients at one time? Nope. Because it's unsafe. You ever seen a speech therapist doing two swallow evals at the same time? Nope. Because it's unsafe. You ever seen a phlebotomist drawing more than one person's blood at a time? Nope. You ever seen an x-ray technician taking chest x-rays or any other x-rays on more than one patient at a time? Nope. 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 Why is it okay? Why are we okay? Why, why do we accept it? Why are you going to go out and work as a respiratory therapist and get told in your preceptorship, this is what's going to happen. You're all going to go get jobs. You're going to pass your TMC. You're going to pass your clinical simulation exam. And you're going to go get a job. And you know what's going to happen? You're going to go through orientation. You know what they're going to tell you? You're really smart. You know what you're doing. But you need to work on your time management. You know what that's code for? It's code for you need to stack therapy. And that's crap. That's not okay, guys. It's not okay. And somewhere along the way, some generation has got to be the generation that breaks 
this routine that we've gotten into to just accepting the fact that I'm given 70 treatments so I must do them all and the only way to do that is to do more than one at a time. That's the truth. So my goal in 2020 is to continue to expose this. Not, not just on that it's wrong from a patient safety standpoint, but that it's wrong from a policy standpoint, that it's wrong from an ethical standpoint, and that it's wrong from a patient care standpoint. We, as respiratory therapists, have got to be better. I'm talking to current respiratory therapists right now. I hope I get a thousand comments on this telling me to shut up. Telling me that I'm crazy, that I'm searching for a unicorn. And you know what I'm going to say? You're damn right. You're damn right. Why would I not pursue excellence? Why would I not pursue something that is so flawed in the nature that nobody will admit that it's happening except for in the social media side of things where people say, yeah, I stack therapy all the time. There's no other way to do it. But when I talk to managers, directors, administration, we don't stack therapy in this hospital. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. You don't want to admit it because you know it's wrong. And that's what you got newcomers coming into. You need to work on your time management. Come on, guys. This, 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 this frustrates me to no end. Now, whew, let's talk about this scenario we got here. Um, Maria, I think, her, I think her last name is Olavela. She sent me an email about a month ago, and on this email was attached a video. And the video was of the airway graphics of a patient that was being mechanically ventilated. Okay, So she sent me this video, and she said, look at what I walked into today. Didn't know what to do. I I ultimately put them in pressure support ventilation, and that's where we left them. But can you help me understand this? Here's my answer, Maria. First of all, I think Maria is a, a friend of mine, but I've never met her. I think that's weird. Like, I want to give her my phone number so we can contact sometimes and just say, hey. So we've had so many conversations. She's been active on this YouTube channel and spurred so many conversations that I'm so appreciative of her and her her active um, role in asking questions and pursuing excellence in her department. You know, she said... I don't like this. I don't like, I don't like the type of care that's being provided in my department. So what do we do? I said, you got to change the culture. You got to get more positive. You got to get people thinking the same way and become more positive. Culture. She said, okay. She went back to her management and she is now the leader of the education. She's now the chair of the education program in her department, working to educate the respiratory therapists that are coming in, the current ones that are currently there and the new ones that are going to be there so that they can all get on the same page. And work to, to promote respiratory therapy so that everybody gains the respect and everybody becomes more uplifted in the work they're doing on a day-to-day basis. Now, here's the, 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 the graphics that were sent to me, okay? It looked essentially like this. This is pressure. This is flow. You can see here you have an alternating pattern. You have a high pressure and a low pressure. A high pressure and a low pressure. Now, when I look at this, I think it's very, very odd that this is happening so rhythmically. You have high pressure, low pressure, high pressure, low pressure. Now, what I do notice is that on my low pressures, I have a dip in my pressure waveform. Now, we know that when you're in a volume mode of ventilation, volume control, whether it's AC or SIMV, if the patient actively breathes during the mechanical ventilator's breath cycle, the diaphragm drops, which drops intrathoracic pressure and pulls your entire pressure down. So that's what I'm thinking is happening here. So that's the first thing I notice. That doesn't explain the rise in the next pressure though. The next breath. You get this rise in pressure in the next breath. It doesn't explain that. So what is exactly happening here? Well, let me take you a step further here. Look at what's happening here. High pressure, High peak inspiratory flow. That's important. Because the lungs, the pressure in the lungs is very, very high. So when expiration happens, the air comes out very, very fast. But look at what happens on the low, on this low pressure breath. Our expiratory flow is very, very low. It's much smaller than on the high pressure. Again, high pressure here, high peak expiratory flow. Low pressure here. Low peak expiratory flow. So Maria, what I think is happening here is you have a patient who is breathing actively 
within the ventilator's cycle, but they are not in sync with the vent. So what I think is happening is when this pressure drops here, you have a diaphragm that is dropping. Because the diaphragm is dropping, this reduces your peak expiratory flow. Now, when this next breath comes, what you have is a diaphragm that is coming back up, working against the next breath, which is making this pressure be very, very high, which results in a very high and fast expiratory flow. The patient's exhaling. The next breath gives. The patient's not exhaling here because this is a low pressure. But then they inhale here, and you get this low expiratory flow. So I think what you have here is just a big kind of an anomaly. You don't see this a lot with patients. Usually if a patient is asynchronous, you'll see this on your pressure waveform. And if this is continuing and severe enough, you'll get an immediately another breath initiated. But that wasn't happening here. So if I had to guess, I would guess that if you can recall this patient, I would guess that there was probably some sort of abdominal paradox happening here also. So that when the patient's the vent gave a breath, the patient's abdomen was, 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 was moving up. And then as they exhaled, you see the ab abdominal cavity and the diaphragm moving back in opposite directions. So if you look from the side of the bed, you see this motion with the chest rise. Now remember, the abdominal cavity is supposed to go out okay, on exhalation. So, I'm sorry, on inhalation, you take a breath in, the diaphragm drops and it pushes the abdominal cavity out. But when the patient is in distress, they, they, they call on the abdominal cavity to help them breathe. That's just a guess of mine. I don't know if it's true or not in terms of if this patient had abdominal paradox. But just based off of what I'm seeing here, erase this, high pressure, low pressure, high pressure, low pressure, High peak expiratory flow, low peak expiratory flow. You look like you got a patient who's breathing, but not in sync with what the vent is doing. The changes in intrathoracic pressure are affecting your mechanical ventilators, uh, ventilating pressures. Okay, And I think what you did is exactly right. What would I have done? I would have put them in pressure support ventilation and let them breathe how they want to. As long as they're adequately ventilating and adequately oxygenating, there's nothing wrong with pressure support ventilation for this patient, okay? So that's what I would have done. I hope that helps explain a little better. Don't forget guys, we get caught up on the pressure waveform sometimes, but whatever's happening up here is also going to affect your expiratory flows down here. So look at them together and tie them together. Make a connection between the two and it'll help you better understand what's happening with your patient, okay? Hey guys, on the verge of January 1st, I'm wishing all of you a fantastic 2020. Go be great.